Greetings to our distinguished guests in this new landmark building of Seoul and participants from around the world on Zoom. My name is uh, Ye Ching Victor Lee. I'm a senior fellow on Northeast Asia Peace and Development at the Global Peace Foundation. I will serve as the moderator for this session. This forum, conveners and partners have been consistently building international support for a free and unified Korea as an immediate, not distant goal. Such a Korea would be nuclear free and uphold freedom, democratic values, rule of law, and human rights based on shared identity and the culture heritage of the Korean people. The Korean dream approach predicated on the ideals embodied in the ancient Korean ethos of Hoingingan, living for the greater benefit of all humanity, can serve as a guiding framework for building this new nation, which can be a catalyst for regional and global peace and development. We advance this agenda, use a collaborative and a comprehensive approach with focused attention on critical issue areas including peace and security, human rights and governance, and economic development. This session is particularly focused on the areas of peace and security. We have a panel of distinguished scholars from different countries to discuss this very important topic. First, I would like to introduce Dr. Uh, Kyung Young Cham, adjunct professor at the Hanyang University, the director of the Institute for Academic Studies of the Action for Korea United Professors Association and the former policy advisor for Presidential National Security Office and the Ministry of National Defense. Let's welcome Dr. Chang. Please speak from the podium. Rapidly reshaping international security orders. China demonstrates its power projection around Taiwan. North Korea proclaimed that it will actualize unification by force and power. Last month, Kim Jong un threatened Republic Korea by saying that North Korea will annihilate. Yun Song Yeol administration and rock forces. The gloomy and adverse security situation urge us to find out fundamental solution. The potential war, non-peace on the Korean Peninsula, regional instability, originate from the division of the Korean Peninsula. Building unified Korea will ensure everlasting peace on the peninsula and stability in Northeast Asia. I would like to address key actor state concern and strategic benefits and civilization significance in the event of unification. Then it will be followed by the discussion of vision for unified Korea. Finally, I will explore implementation strategy to achieve the unification. Key actor state might worry about instability in the process of unification and uncertainty around unified Korea political ideology. Neighboring country might also feel burdened from potential economic assistance. However, strategic benefit from unification will overwhelmingly supersede and burden any concern. North Korea hostile attitude, massive 
destruction, weapon system, will be saliently diminished in the process of unification. Moreover, the emergence of a unified Korea could serve as a transaction facilitating political, economic, cultural, even security cooperation among states in the region. This would be lead to regional community. From a civilization perspective, unified Korea would imply the end of the Cold War era, which currently existing now. It would also liberate North Korea from poverty, human rights violation. And it would also send a strong signal to other failed states in the world community. Strategic cooperation between United States and China would successfully enable the two Korea to become one nation. This unified Korea would then in return transform the hegemony library into co-evolutionary relation between two great powers. I would like to address the vision for unified Korea. Absolutely, unified Korea will be achieved by the two Korea leadership through the following synchronized effort. Share the vision of a unified Korea, implementation strategies, and domestic unification consensus into Korean national unification will and international cooperation. First, unified Korea serving as new nation building should embody the spirit of Hong Yi Gan as the guiding sort of our national foundation for mercy, living great benefit for all human beings. Unified Korea will be born again as a national community based on extended family culture, reflecting dedication and love. A unification new nation pursue non-nuclear policy and peace and a universal value consisting of this liberal democracy, free market economic system, the education based on civil duty and ethic, freedom of speech and the press, particularly the freedom of religion, which are imperative for the new nation actualizing Korean dream. Thirdly, unified Korea pursue lack US alliance, as well as regional multilateral security cooperation in Northeast Asia. I'm so confident unified Korea will become a hub for geopolitics, transportation and logistics, and the finance, science, technology. Prospectively, Unified Korea will take the lead in creating free, prosperous, civilization, global community. I would like to address implementation strategy for building Unified Korea. The first, the two Korea will take the initiatives in creating cooperative unification environment. The two Korea should work together by exploring North South Korea task respectively and identifying joint task in order to achieve unification. Along with collaboration with neighboring country and international institutional organization such as the United Nations. Secondly, lack US alliance, which has made a great contribution like liberal democratic state along with a digital led country, a six export largest country, a six in military power ranking, as well as cultural soft power country. On the state, each action the alliance 
undertake should be made with consideration for how to achieve the goal of unification. To facilitate that task, I would like to make strong recommendation to the President of the United States of South Korea. Why not establish strategic unification combined task force? The team will consist of policymakers, experts, develop a comprehensive implementation plan for peaceful unification, denuclearization, human rights, and uh, for contingency plan in the event of North Korean collapse. Simultaneously, we have never underestimated North Korean Kim Jong-un intent. Kim Jong-un continuously to unify, communize the whole Korean Peninsula in military manners. We never absolutely allowed North Korea to achieve unification in their manners. In the sense, like US, Japan, security collaboration so essential to prevent any kind of potential North Korean military adventurism. And simultaneously, civil society such as Action for Korea United, Overseas Korea Diaspora, including AKU, United States of America, and the Committee for Human Rights in North Korea are critical for informing, educating, and advocating unification among Korean people as well as international community. Finally, the two Korea, United States, and China should launch strategic talks in order to transform the current instability army structures into a peace regime, political negotiation among four parties should be taken to sign a peace treaty. Let us proactively participate in a comprehensive campaign for building unified Korea. I am confident unified Korea will come to reality with our generation. Our generation will become a historical creator for the unification of this divided nation. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Chan, for your very comprehensive uh, talk. And then, um, uh, and especially it's on this uh, uh, implementation strategy of uh, the both Korea Initiative and the uh, US RK Alliance, the presidential level of strategic unification task force, and the four party talks, all those things are very important. Really, thank you. Uh, second, I would like to introduce um, Dr. Hyung Wook Kim, Professor and Director General at Korea National Diplomatic Academy. He's also a former advisory member for the National Security Council and the Ministry of Unification, currently a standing member for the National Unification Advisory Council. Yeah, let's welcome Dr. Kim. Okay. Um... Thank you for inviting, in, inviting me to this uh, wonderful conference. I uh, uh, did not have to, I have to speak in English, but everybody speaks in English, so I might have to speak in English too. Uh, the time limit that I was uh, uh, given is seven to eight minutes, so I'll just try to be simple and clear uh, uh, so that the message would be easily delivered. Uh, first, I have uh, five points about what the free and unified Korea will be. Um, the title and the theme of the talk is whether free and unified Korea will be a catalyst for regional and global peace and development. Um, so first point I would like to make is that uh, unified, free and unified Korea will be nuclear free. Um, I'm not sure about the North Korean side because, uh, you know, North Korea, for the North Korean regime, the nuclear weapons is a very essential element. Uh, without the nuclear weapons, I don't think the Kim Jong-un regime will be easily maintained. Uh, a lot of purposes are there. It will be uh, to deal with domestic uh, you know, people, uh, to deal with the US side, and to deal with Chinese side. Um, but I think uh, one thing 
that is very clear for South Korean government is that if the unified Korea will be free and democratic, I think uh, it will be nuclear free. Um, the nuclear weapon possessing uh, unified Korea, I don't think will be contributing to the regional peace. It will be another uh, disastrous element after unification. Second part, I think, is the unified Korea will be free democratic. Um, the North Korean people are experiencing uh, authoritarian regime based uh, you know, damages on their freedom and, and rights. Uh, they need to have their own right to listen to what is going on outside. Uh, they need to have their own freedom uh, for their own wealthy and prosperous lives. Uh, but under the current North Korean regime, uh, North Korean people are not enjoying their right uh, for their lives. So I think uh, under the uh, unified Korea, uh, which would be free and democratic Korea, the people of the unified Korea will definitely have the right to enjoy their, their freedom and lives. Um, third element would be that unified Korea will be market economy. Uh, this definitely will give a lot of opportunities for the regional and global countries to invest. Um, North Korea will be another jackpot for economic growth. Uh, many countries will uh, invest their money on North Korean development. This will be a very important part to upgrade at the regional and global economic uh, level. Um, now the North Korea is the only country that is isolated, does not possess market economic system. Uh, even China, even Vietnam, and even other countries, even though their political system is socialist, their economic system is market economy. So I think uh, uh, unified Korea will give a very important chance for North Korea to transfer their, you know, economic system into market economy. Uh, fourth, I think uh, the unified Korea will be uh, achieved peacefully. Uh, this is a very important part um, because the only historical case that has achieved the unification peacefully is German case. Other cases uh, unified uh, by warfare, uh, by unpeaceful method. So I think this will be very important home homework for the Korean unification because two different political systems are not easily mingled into one. Uh, it can be free democratic system, it can be socialist system, and we definitely want the unified Korea to be free democratic, uh, which, which means that uh, there will be a lot of harsh resistance from the North Korean regime. Uh, it's a zero-sum game. Uh, there is no mingle, there is no middle road for the two political systems to be, uh, you know, mingled into one. So this is a very um, important homework. Uh, South Korean and North Korean have different formula for the unification. Um, North Korean formula for the unification is to, to deal with political and military issues first, and then make one country with two different political systems. Uh, South Korean formula is to focus on economic integration first and make the two countries and two different systems, you know, um, you know uh, exist for a while. But the ultimate goal is definitely a one country with one political system, which is very, very difficult for two Koreas to achieve. So that's homework. And we might have to think about it very hard because we don't want to be a socialist country. And North Korea does not want to be a free democratic country under the current Kim Jong-un regime. This would be a very big hurdle in the future. Um, far fifth point, I think, is that um, nevertheless, the unified Korea will contribute to the regional peace and integration. Um, German cases, uh, two, uh, two Germans, two Germanys and a Berlin world 
uh, dividing two and one Berlin into two was a symbol of Cold War. Um, and I think Germany was very lucky because if there were no collapse of the Soviet Union, they would not have experienced unification. Um, and I hope that that happens to the Korean Peninsula. But um, now the US-China clashes and competition is very severe. And under this US-China competition, it's not very easy for two Koreas to find a chance for the unification because, um, for example, China uh, prefers the strong China-North Korea relations more than denuclearization of North Korea. Um, so under the US-China competition, North and South Koreas are divided into each camp. Uh, it's not easy for us to find any good chances and opportunities for the unification, even though we try hard, you know. Um, so this is a very big hurdle, but I think that there will be um, more and more uh, efforts by two Koreas and experts and, and, and policymakers find solutions for these homeworks. Thank you very much. Thank you, Dr. Kim, for your very clear message on the five points. Nuclear free, free democratic, market economy, peaceful achieve, uh, the unification and also uh, unified Korea can contribute to regional uh, peace and integration. Yeah, we thank you. Thank you. Um, then next, let's welcome Dr. Uh, uh, Doc Bando, a senior fellow at the Cato Institute, a former special assistant to President Reagan. And he has long time interest in Korea issues and appear on many mainstream media um, regularly on Korean issue. And he has been to both South and Korea many times. Let's welcome um, uh, Doug Bender. Thank you. Well, thank you very much. It's a great pleasure to be here. Uh, first, we have important issues that we are discussing in a very dangerous time, if one looks at the international environment. And it's critically important for the ROK to be at the center of the solution of these kinds of issues. And it's my first time back since 2019, so it's a wonderful opportunity to see friends again and to uh, talk to uh, South Koreans who are in the epicenter of what's going on in Northeast Asia. The environment that we have today is quite challenging. We have an ongoing hot war in Europe, which has spillover into Asia. Uh, in many ways that uh, may uh, operate uh, very unpredictably. The Russia-China relationship, uh, Russia's relationship with Japan, the issue of sanctions and uh, the ROK's role, the um, potential of expansion of hostilities even within Europe, the issues of nuclear weapons, all of this is kind of in the background. We're, we are, of course, hopeful that we'll see a peaceful resolution, but this is having an impact on Asia. Uh, second is the US-China relationship that we have seen grown uh, you know, significantly worse over the last three or four years. And over the last couple of weeks, the issue of Taiwan springing forth as a, a potential issue of confrontation and also rather dangerous, I think, uh, not in the short term, but in the mid to long term and any hostilities there would have extraordinary implications for all countries in the region. We're already seeing North Korea play its card for both Russia and China endorsing their positions. And then we have the Korean Peninsula. Uh, the challenge here, of course, is we see a North Korea that is uncommunicative, that's in economic uh, great difficulties, has suffered apparently through significant COVID infection, which they now claim is entirely solved to somewhat. Some of us are skeptical. Uh, the ROK has a new government to deal with these issues. And the US is frankly distracted, you know, trying to deal with the European war, trying to come up with a policy towards China, dealing with domestic issues, political, economic, and other, with uh, upcoming elections merely three months away which in Washington concentrates the mind. So all of this is happening in this environment. 
and this is an environment that desperately needs development, peace, and security. And all of those issues are tied up with the future of the Korean Peninsula. And the path forward, understandably, at a time like this, is difficult and challenging. And all countries in the region have a very important role to play and have responsibilities to play it <clears throat> to promote these values. The biggest challenge at the moment is dealing with North Korea. That uh, you know, North Korea you know, is at the moment refusing to negotiate. The challenge then is finding a way to convince them that it's in their interest to step forward and deal peacefully with uh, the Republic of Korea as well as other parties in the region. And South Korea needs to find a way to provide incentives you know, for the North while also guarding its own security interests because we've seen how North Korea is prepared to respond to the ROK as it did under the Moon administration. We have to find a way to convince the North Koreans they can benefit even as they are fearful of being swallowed, as they put it, by a much larger and more successful South Korea. And the question of the role of the United States in the peninsula in the future, if there is a unified Korea and what that looks like and how that role will play. And South Korea has to be at the center of this movement forward, but as we might call them the whales, uh, you know, the shrimp among whales, as was once said, the whales are still there. The US, China, Russia, and Japan, all of them have roles to play to try to move the peninsula forward peacefully, to find ways to convince the North Koreans that they can be secure and that they can gain from this process of unification. <clears throat> that, uh, and that requires, I think, these other countries to be able to separate Korea from their own disputes, because all of these countries have these disputes that have been on display very recently, and have to be able to find ways to moderate their own relations where they're able to come together and work with the Koreas to try to help bring unification to the peninsula. And success uh, in bringing the Koreas together, of course, would be a useful example for the larger countries that are out there of how China might find a way uh, to work with the Taiwan so both societies can find themselves in accord in the relationship they're going to have. Finding a way for the United States and China to move forward in a way that will be peaceful despite the great gulf that separates our nations at this time. So a success in the peninsula could have far reaching implications well beyond Northeast Asia in terms of relationships of other countries. As for a strategy in moving forward, I would certainly see the uh, ROK as taking the lead in trying to find a way to work with North Korea to emphasize better bilateral relations both between governments and peoples and the importance I think we all want to see engagement with the North Korean people to the extent that is possible. Obviously challenges dealing with the North Korean government, but the more North Korean people understand the potential positive future of reunification, the better. And important, I think, to emphasize economic development, which is desperately needed in North Korea. Anyone who visits the North certainly understands the gulf that separates uh, the DPRK from South Korea. Probably requires setting the political future, you know, leaving that open for the future to decide. The politics, of course, is the biggest problem in dealing with the North. The question of how to convince a North Korean government to move forward in conjunction with the democratic capital of South Korea, as Dr. Kim pointed out, the only real future of a unified Korea is democratic and is capitalist. It is one that's integrated into the world, one that plays the role that the, the people of this country have created, a successful society that today is playing an important role simply as half the peninsula. A united Korea could play a much greater role than working together. That, uh, that is going to be a challenge. And then finding the way to convince the whales, as I called them, to promote security and development, to be willing to set their advantage aside to assist the Koreas as they move forward into the future. Now, the question of why one Korea, especially from the standpoint of other countries, 
my view is number one, it's long overdue. The Koreas have been separated for 77 years. Cyprus's uh, separation is about 48 years and counting. Germany was separated 45 years before it came back together. Countries like Vietnam and Yemen had uh, shorter periods of, of separation. It really is time for the Korean people to be able to move together in unity. And if we address unification, one inevitably addresses other issues of proliferation, of human rights, of economic development. All of those issues have to be dealt with and confronted as part of a process of reunification. So your reunification can become the mechanism by which one can be looking at and dealing with other very difficult issues. And a unified Korea would reduce one source of tension and potential confrontation in this region. Historically, North Korea has been the biggest problem in Northeast Asia. Now one can look at Taiwan. If one looks at the last two or three weeks, might, one might decide that the Taiwan, US, China relationship might have moved to the fore. I certainly hope not. Nevertheless, that's an issue of great concern at the moment. But if we want to see a peaceful Northeast Asia and larger Asia itself solving the confrontation that has been on this peninsula for 75 or more years is, I think, at the center of that. One could certainly uh, encourage wider economic development by bringing North Korea in and integrating a country as part of this process. And it's certainly worth the attention, particularly of the United States. I think the attention of the ROK is guaranteed at the moment the US and the Biden administration are quite distracted. But this issue is far too important to let it languish. Uh, we cannot you know, set this aside and hope to return to it in another five or 10 years. You know, that is simply a, a strategy of failure that leaves open great possibilities of failure this is something that needs to be addressed today in the midst of confrontation and challenge around the world. It needs to be addressed in the midst of fears in terms of, the, of development and fears of health and fears of economics and other things on the peninsula. So this is one I would hope that the ROK can take the lead and we can have countries surrounding the ROK willing to work with it to try to help find a way to move south and north together into this unified future that Dr. Kim talked about, of the a future of a democratic and a capitalist Korea that will benefit both peoples and the region itself. Thank you. Thank you, Doc. Yeah, for your clear strategy to move forward to emphasize better bilateral relations between the peoples and the governments of both North and South, uh, promote economic development, and also leave political development open and the turn, based on that, turn to the whales for support. And, um, okay, next we will have a video message from uh, Dr. Nang Ni uh, in China. Uh, due to the very strict uh, policy, poli uh, COVID policy, he will not be here with us, but he did uh, send a message. He's a research fellow at the Institute of American Studies at the China Academy of Social Sciences. So his research mainly focuses on North, uh, US North Korea relations and uh, US North Korea, um, uh, China North Korea relations. Dr. Lee has been a visiting scholar at the Seoul National University, Brookings Institute, Johns Hopkins Science, uh, Kim, Jong, uh, Kim Jong Sun University in North Korea. Uh, let's welcome uh, his message. Thanks for having me here, and many apologies I cannot join you on leave due to my current visit to Tibet. I'm recording the video sharing my view on Korean unification and looking forward to hearing your comments and views. From Chinese view, the geopolitical structure of Northeast Asia still remains a Cold War state, chiefly because of Korean division. Despite the highly dynamic and profound social, economic developments and transformation throughout the region. Under circumstance of zero-sum game in the region, whether a unified Korea will meaningfully alter the geopolitic landscape in Northeast Asia is becoming a big concern from China. 
there is no doubt that China support one-state political solution, viewing the peninsula's current divisions as historical anomaly. China's official stance and interest are clear to define. The current Chinese policy envisions a durable peace on Korean Peninsula, which leads to peaceful reunification on the principles of self-determination. The implication is no foreign foreign forces should interfere with the process of unification. So, although the clarification put China's in the pro-unification camp, I personally think Chinese invasion for Korean Korean unification will more focus on how to achieve the unification than the unification itself. Concerning China's stance and behavior in reaction to any scenario that would produce a reunified Korea, I think China, ROK, and other parties should keep close engagement, share information, and coordinate pace during the process. For decades, China has kept its consistent principles of no war and no chaos at the Korean Peninsula, opposing any military production and intervention from both sides. China agrees that the unification is Korean affairs. For my paper, I raised several questions about a possible scenario of unification. The first one is, how will the future and unified Korea related to the existing alliances? There are currently two bilateral alliances, namely the US ROK alliance and the, the US Japan alliance. A unified Korea may not replace existing alliances. What the new function of the alliances in future? This raises another question. What is the relationship between the hub and spoke structure and a unified Korea. Will there will be tension between them? In order to ease tension, the bilateral alliances must be restrained in some way to limit its potential negative impact on regional peace and security. U.S. power in Northeast Asia, however, largely relies on U.S. ROK alliance and U.S. Japan alliance. The United States continue build up of military capabilities within this relationship has spread strategic distrust throughout the region. As a result, DPRK is increasingly unwilling to diplomatically engage with the United States instead of pre preparing for a confrontation of the United States for long term. In the context of China-U.S. competition, given the United States keep building it up its alliance through military means, even making progress on trilateral cooperation between its alliance, the tension between these alliances and the possible unification process will grow, probably, probably leaving no space for the unification by peace. So the big concern for China now is the Korean clarification of this of its position on whether U.S. military presence would remain on Korean Peninsula when unification is achieved. In realist the worst case scenario, a rising Korea that maintains U.S. forces and an inherent northern arsenal becomes a strategic concern related to the core interest of China. A handful of reassurances from Korea could assuage many of Beijing's concerns. Although, although a unified Korea should settle some disputed issues with China, such as territory dispute like a fishing area, etc., etc. Such concerns are related to the China principle on Korean unification. If they could be addressed well, China, ROK, DPRK, and the U.S. would build confidence, and also the Chinese domestic audience could be persuaded that China's position in Korea is still secure. Now the United States and China engage 
in what is called New Cold War, even two sides deny it. Despite the two sides' long-standing diplomatic relationship, high degree of interdependence, and a continued cooperation and exchanges in the economy, social, and culture field, even somewhat in the area of the military security, U.S. is playing strategic containment with China. This new era of Cold War thinking has contributed to increase tension in the region, promoting fears of arm raising behavior and a possibly military escalation. This competition also stress, stifles cooperation among other powers in this region, who must carefully balance security and economic relationship with United States, China against each other. For progress to be made at the regional level, a resolution of larger geopolitical competition must first to be reached to achieve some sort of detente between China and the United States. Major powers in Northeast Asia, China, United States, and Russia should abandon this new Cold War and instead seek a new model of core existence and uh, that accommodates competition while promoting cooperation in the area where it's feasible. Instead of worsening their strategic and ideological divergences, the United States and China should instead focus on building functional cooperation in areas that serve each other's national interest. A secondary goal of the cooperation would be demonstrate to other countries in the region that the interaction between China and the United States does not preclude co a collab collab collaboration on important functional issue. So my conclusion is there is a little certainty regarding Korean reunification, and it's hard to predict future development. Uh, two absolutes concerning China's stance are apparent. However, first, the Chinese seek to join the process and take constructive role in the Korean Peninsula unification. And second, uh, suspicious toward, toward U.S. intentions will condition Chinese thinking and option. So China and the U.S. should ultimately reach a consensus as long as all parties' high-level political military engagement, including increasing the strategic trust between China and the U.S., uh, could help uh, reduce fears and uh, correct misconceptions. Thank you very much. Yeah, Dr. Yi very clearly stated China's uh, current policy envision uh, durable peace on the peninsula, which leads to peaceful reunification on the principles of self-determination. So, and also he uh, could talk about China's concern uh, in the larger context of uh, US-China confrontation. But even with that, he's still quite positive focus on how even US-China can collaborate uh, among this uh, competition. So let's, yeah, be positive and uh, hope China can play a uh, so, uh, supporting role for this. Okay, so our next speaker is uh, Dr. Uh, Sachio Nakato, uh, Professor of International Relations of the College of International Relations at the Rismaker University in Tokyo, Japan. He is also a peacemaker with a Korean wife. He's one of the most respected Japanese scholars on Korean issues. Let's welcome Dr. Nakato. Uh, my name is Sachi Nakato from Japan, not from Tokyo, actually Kyoto. Uh, uh, <clears throat> And it is my pleasure to be here, and I'm very much uh, thankful for the organizers to give me a chance to share my thought on the question of the unification of the, of the Korean Peninsula 
uh, from Japan's uh, strategic perspectives, as well as the uh, nuclear issues of the North uh, Korean Peninsula. <clears throat> Uh, first of all, uh, I was listening to the previous speakers in the morning, and many uh, clearly mentioned that uh, they support uh, peaceful Korean unification. And if I say, uh, for example, uh, Japan also support uh, Korean unification, uh, do you really believe? Uh, the reason why I, I pro propose this question is uh, when I, whenever I, I speak say uh, Japan support Korean unification, uh, many experts, uh, policy makers, they often ask me if it is the case. Uh, one of the, uh, of course, there are some discourses in, even in Japan too. If uh, Korea unified, then it might be a problem for Japan. So one of the discussion is unified Korea is going to be bigger and stronger than Japan that is going to be a threat to Japan. But again, uh, <clears throat> that depends on what kind of unification, how unification is promoted. That is more important question for Japan's strategic point of view. Uh, for example, uh, if Korea is unified, as everybody here mentioned, a free, a democratic, and nuclear free then that would be a good uh, for Japan too. But at the same time, if unified Korea with nuclear weapons, with anti-Japan sentiment, and very close to China, probably uh, many Japanese strategists would argue that it may not be a good uh, uh, form for Japan uh, in Japan's strategic point of view. So again, that, is, that depends on the uh, uh, how and what kind of unifications uh, we can see in the future. Of course, the Korean unification itself, it, well, it should be promoted by Korean people on the Korean, Korean Peninsula and abroad and uh, surrounding countries, including Japan. I believe that they have to support the process of Korean unification. Then what can, what can Japan do? Uh, I'm not very really sure how many of you uh, still remember that uh, about 20 years ago, uh, former Prime Minister Koizumi and for, uh, Chairman Kim Jong-il, uh, they established the so-called the Pyongyang Agreement, a declaration uh, in September 17, 2002. In that statement, it clearly said that uh, Japan and North Korea need to normalize uh, their relations, and after that, Japan is supposed to provide economic assistance to North Korea. Uh, how much uh, is Japan is going to uh, uh, support or uh, provide economic uh, cooperation to uh, North Korea? It is uh, probably as the same amount of the uh, economic cooperation provided to South Korea back in 1965 with current value. So this is uh, one thing that Japan can do, but uh, if you look at the uh, uh, Blue Book published by Ministry of Foreign Affairs Japan, the Japanese policy toward North Korea is to normalize uh, relations with North Korea by resolving uh, the abduction issues, nuclear issues, and missile issues comprehensively. The, the, the problem for Japan is, Japan is not in a position uh, to solve nuclear issues and mis as well as missile issues. So in that sense, the development of uh, the, the, the resolving nuclear issue actually is more like a precondition for Japan to normalize uh, relations in North Korea. Abduction issues, yes, there are some progress, but uh, currently Japan demands North Korea uh, to open, what, uh, to return all the victims to Japan. But North Korea uh, clearly mentioned that the issue is already resolved. There is no opportunity for Japan and North Korea at this moment to promote a dialogue regarding the question of abduction issues. So unfortunately, unless Japan uh, have a chance to uh, start dialogue with North Korea, 
it's almost impossible to solve these issues. Again, unless resolving uh, these uh, issues, abduction issues, nuclear and missile issues, Japan is not going to uh, able to normalize with North Korea. Unfortunately, the Pyongyang declaration, uh, including many important issues, such as human rights issues of Korean residents in Japan, that is also the, the issue to be solved uh, between Japan and North Korea. And also, uh, Japan has to resolve the history issues on the question of Japanese colonization of the Korean Peninsula, especially in this case, northern part. So the, the, uh, what Japan has to do is just to do what Japan agreed with North Korea back uh, 20 years ago. But again, nuclear issues and a missile issue is more imminent uh, threat to Japan. Therefore, Japan has not really engaged in history issues as well as human rights issues of the Korean resident in Japan. In that sense, yes, we have to solve the question of nuclear issues. I'd like to propose some of the questions on North Korea's nuclear problems. I'm not going to give any, uh, I, I am not able to give any uh, uh, clear uh, solutions, but I could ask some of the questions on this issue. The first question is, are we talking about the nuclearization of the Korean Peninsula or the nuclearization of North Korea? If I ask this question, Many people, especially from the conservative camp, they clearly say that that's a stupid question. It's about the equalization of North Korea. And uh, in Japan, that is obvious. That is the equalization of North Korea. But again, if we look at the, uh, the statement provided by North Korea, North Koreans always say that nuclear threat or nuclear weapons targeted at the northern part of the Korean Peninsula. That can be also included on the question of the nuclearization of the Korean Peninsula. How do you understand this uh, uh, question? Another question, uh, the reason why North Korea is going to, uh, uh, has developed nuclear weapon. If you look at the statement by North Korea, they say that that is because of US hostile policy. If I ask this question to uh, former US uh, uh, negotiators, they all let's say that that is completely propaganda. So what do you mean by hostile policy to the North? According to their explanation, there are mainly two. Uh, US allocate military, uh, joint military exercise and also economic sanctions. So uh, if you look at uh, what uh, Che Son he uh, mentioned last year, unless the United States uh, stop hostile policy toward North Korea, they have no intention to have negotiation with the United States. Or you could ask that, if, especially if you, are, if you are from the conservative camp, you would argue that the reason why North Korea has developed nuclear weapons is because the possession of nuclear weapon itself is their goal. Because it's, if you have nuclear weapons, it's so advantageous over other countries, including the South Korea. So how do you understand this question? And finally, uh, coming back to the question of uh, unification of the Korean Peninsula, as well as uh, the uh, nuclear uh, problems of the Korean Peninsula. Uh, from Japan's point of view, Japan has always emphasized the importance of U.S. allocate a Japan trilateral cooperation in dealing with the North Korean nuclear problems. But unfortunately, it is getting very difficult for Japan and South Korea to uh, establish cooperation because of history issues and a misunderstanding of how to uh, manage uh, Japan Korea relations and such and such. Right now, the UN administration uh, expressed uh, a strong will to improve relations between Japan and South Korea. And unfortunately, the uh, Kishida administration has not responded positively to the call from South Korea. Uh, there are many reasons because there are some suspicions 
on uh, the intention from South Korea. Uh, Japan still uh, is suspicious that North Korea, uh, South Korea is uh, positively respond to solve the history issues. Uh, from Japan's perspective right now, uh, Japan argued that the uh, Supreme Court uh, judgment on the question of uh, comfort movement issues, as well as the forced labor issue, that is the violation of international agreement between Japan and South Korea. That is the position of Japan. Uh, for, if you look at the case of history issue, it may be unthinkable uh, from South Korea's uh, point of view. But again, uh, unless uh, South Korea deal with these history uh, issues, Japan may not possibly respond to South Korea's uh, call. I do not think that is the, uh, this kind of Japanese attitude is correct. I also think that Japan should possibly respond to the call from South Korea. And finally, I'd like to mention that, again, uh, surrounding countries, including Japan, need to support uh, the promotion of free and peaceful Korean unification. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Dr. Nagato, uh, for your many interesting questions and the touch on many issues uh, from uh, abduction and uh, missiles, the, uh, nuclear weapon, human rights, all those things, and then also really talking about the need to serious uh, address the trust issue between uh, ROK and Japan. Yeah, okay. So our next speaker is uh, Dr. Vladimir Ivanov, uh, adjunct senior fellow at the uh, Stimson Center. Um, based in Bosco, uh, he leads uh, pra uh, programmatic activities aimed at promoting better understanding between Russia and other countries to avoid in advent uh, conflict escalation and enhance policy alignment on issues of uh, common concerns. So let's uh, welcome Dr. Ivanov. Uh, dear colleagues, uh, first of all, I wanted to thank the organizers for bringing, bringing us all together here in this pivotal place of Seoul at this pivotal historic time. The military conflict between Russia and Ukraine unfolding as a proxy war in Europe between Russia, the United States and its allies has dramatically changed the context for the international security debate. Direct involvement in military hostilities of an unprecedented scale of one of the major P5 members will have a long lasting impact on the concept and approaches to strategic stability and critical regional conflicts. Korean divide is one of such conflicts with global implications. In my remarks, uh, I'd like to outline a few possible consequences for the prospects of Korea denuclearization and unification agenda as they transpire from the uh, ongoing tectonic shift in Russia's geopolitical thinking and international standing. Well, first, uh, about challenges and risks that come out of this situation. My concern number one relates to the growing difficulties in advancing denuclearization of Korea Peninsula and creation of a nuclear weapon free zone in Northeast Asia, which is a fundamental prerequisite to a free and unified Korea. Military engagement and an increasing risk of the issue of the use of nuclear weapon by P5 member one of the guarantors of the Budapest Memorandum in a conflict with a non-nuclear country is obviously a hit to the sustainability of the nuclear weapon-free zone concept in general. As many experts observe, it will incite the emerging nuclear powers, particularly DPRK, to pursue their nuclear and missile programs and discourage those who have been considering the option to adhere to nuclear weapon-free zone policy. In recent parallel statements ahead of the 10th NPT review conference, the United States and Russian presidents reiterated the famous Reagan-Gorbachev formula that a nuclear war cannot be and must uh, cannot be won and must never be fought. The very same call <clears throat> had been reaffirmed in a joint 
statement by P5 in January this year. It did not prevent the start of Russia-Ukraine hostilities, followed by a halt in Russian-American strategic arms control consultations, reportedly imposed by Washington, and a surge of nuclear escalation rhetoric by Russian officials and government-controlled media. Particularly disturbing is an obvious trend in Russia's domestic media campaign to banalize and emphasize inevitability of a nuclear conflict. This narrative gains support from the expert community developing arguments that destructive consequences of the nuclear scenario may be exaggerated, particularly in case of a limited use of nuclear payload, and that zero-sum game in a nuclear conflict is not impossible. Against this backdrop, particular anxiety has been caused by amendments to the Constitution of the Republic of Belarus voted at the referendum in February this year, abolishing its nuclear weapon-free status. While there has been no visible changes in Russia's official position and strategic interest in support of nuclear weapon-free Korean Peninsula, these trends risk to undermine Moscow's credibility as a security guarantor in the nuclear weapon-free zone engagement in uh, Northeast Asia. Korea unification process may be further complicated by an increasingly adversarial nature of global competition between Russia and China on the one hand, and US and its allies in Euro Atlantic and Asia Pacific on the other. Even if the nuclear issue of the peninsula is miraculously resolved, reaching a neutral, non-aligned status of the Korean, of the unified Korea which is a critical matter for Russia's geopolitical considerations, may become challenging in the current utterly unstable regional environment. Uh, but now I would also like to uh, point some opportunities and the role of the free and unified Korea movement. First, following the introduction by the West of a drastic personal, financial, technological, and economic sanction regime against Russia, its pivot to Asia raises to the level of an existential imperative. Although South Korea has joined these restrictions, the unification agenda may open new opportunities for engaging with Russia diplomatically and economically, particularly through targeted extraction of certain issues and sectors out of the general sanctions policy box. Examples of such compromise topics where acceptable exemptions could be found in alignment with the US administration include uh, WMD non-proliferation, food security, and climate change. In this context, it is important to flag that in its recently adopted maritime doctrine, Russia indicates its strategic intent to develop interstate agreements on the limitation of military and naval activities in agreed areas and zones in Asia Pacific. Second, one significant dimension of Russia-Ukraine crisis is a post-Cold War national integration controversy. In this respect, it stands in line with the other two major national unification disputes with global implications, Taiwan and Korea. Six months after the start of the Russian special operation in Ukraine, and it's slipping into a long-lasting war of attrition, it becomes obvious that military solution to a complex national identity issue is too costly for the parties involved and for the mankind in, in general. Both Chinese and Koreans have lessons to learn from this experiment, in quotes, in Europe, finding new impetus and arguments for collective effort in quest of respective peaceful solutions. A strong social political movement for Korea unification inspired by the Korean dream spiritual tradition gives Koreans a unique chance to succeed in this effort. Thirdly, another dimension of the Ukrainian crisis can be characterized as Russian geopolitical revolt against the global US dominance. Its general strategic intent to reshape the existing international order as incompatible with Russia's security interests transpires clearly from the history of Russia's relations with US and NATO since at least 2007-2008. However, this uh, rationale, timing, forms, and consequences of what happened on February 24th go beyond rational explanations and are fraught with 
further considerable unpredictability. That is why I call it revolt. At the same time, amidst, amidst the turmoil of political mobilization and militarization of societies, the underlying demand for peaceful solutions is higher than ever before. It can well be observed through evolving expert discussions in a country's major stakeholders of the Russia-Ukraine conflict. What is lacking in most of these places is elite's passion and strong nationwide political will in driving the peace agenda. This energy does exist in Korea with its national unification movement. Time has come and windows of opportunities are opening for the global leg game toward a more balanced world order. Sharing Korea's peace building experience with advanced national elites in critical regions <clears throat> could be an essential element for a mutually reinforcing effort. Some experts in Russia argue that ROK is a weak link in the united front of the developed powers opposing Russia. However, from the peace building perspective, it can well be considered a strong link, a strong link to reconnect Russia and the world. In practical terms, I'm happy uh, to be part of this effort as the head of the Russia program at Stimson Center, residing in Moscow. I'm currently working with colleagues from the Global Peace Foundation and Blue Banner on launching a set of joint projects with a goal to expose Russian and American policymaking communities to the most advanced concepts of nuclear free and unified Korea. One of important purposes of these activities is to help sustain communication channels between United States and Russia and contribute to de-escalating the current crisis, I hope transitory crisis. Thank you for your uh, attention and look forward to further discussion and practical engagement. Thank you, Dr. Ivanov, uh, for your timely talk on linking the Russian-Ukraine crisis to these two major national unification disputes uh, with global implication, uh, Korea and Taiwan, and also so recognize um, uh, uh, the strong social political movement for Korean unification inspired the Korean dream, and then um, the unique chance to succeed uh, with this particular time, and even talk about the Korea's role for connecting Russia to the world. And I uh, really hope uh, you can really succeed to uh, uh, expose Russia and the American policymakers uh, communities to the most advanced concept of nuclear free and unified Korea. Okay, thank you. Um, now I would like to introduce uh, Dr. Jagnath Panda, uh, head of the Stockholm uh, Center for South Asian and Indo-Pacific Affairs at the Institute for Security and Development Policy in Sweden. He was a former research fellow and the center head for East Asia at the uh, Manoha Parika Institute for Defense Studies and Analysis in New Delhi, India. Let's welcome Dr. Panda. Thank you. Uh, let me at the outset thank uh, Global Peace Foundation, uh, Chairman Moon, uh, President uh, uh, Jim Flynn, uh, Vice President uh, David Karpara, uh, Mr. Indak So. Um, also, I'm grateful to Chair uh, Mr. Lee and also Ms. Uh, Pinchin for all the logistical support. Now, let me begin by saying that here we are talking about free and united Korea. Now, anything we are talking about a futuristic in the sense that any prospects of a united Korea is not going to be free of challenge. And I think that should be the bottom line of thinking that whenever we are talking about peace, stability, and unification, there will always be difficulty and challenges. So my note here would be that it is important to talk about the peace process, but it is equally important to discuss about what would lead to this peace process. And therefore, I think what we need to discuss at the outset is that whether the peace process is still intact, whether the peace process is still existing at this moment or not. And I'm sorry to be a little pessimistic here. And I think uh, I would be pessimistic by saying that probably the peace process 
has lost its track over the last three, three years or so. And it, is lost, it has lost its significance and lost its track primarily because of a range of activities, range of incidents that has occurred over the last three to four years. And I think um, one of the primary reason has been is not only, uh, only Northeast is centric, there are a range of other incidents that has happened which are directly or uh, indirectly linked with the entire peace process in the Korean Peninsula. And I think, of course, the first uh, thing that has actually affected the peace process is, you know, DPRK's continuous missile and nuclear test. And that has to be tackled uh, by force, by peaceful means, by through dialogue, through, you know, peaceful mechanisms that we have to find a way out. But definitely this issue of, you know, trying to keep pressurizing North Korea not to go for missile and nuclear test has not really worked out. So therefore, this has definitely derailed the peace process. The second one is less Northeast Asia centric, more uh, Asia centric. And I think the tensions between China and India. And if we see last three years, the tensions between China and India are continuously rising. This might not have a direct link with the peace process in the Northeast Asia or with the Korean Peninsula, but definitely this is a significant uh, conflicting issues that is actually diverting the peace process in the regions. And given the close connections China shares with North Korea, the, given the close connection China shares with the East Asian regions, it is, um, uh, it is an important uh, incident which has definitely um, impacted the peace process. Third issue is uh, undoubtedly the Russia-Ukraine war. Uh, given Russia's significant positioning in the, uh, in the um, uh, Northeast Asian security architecture. And I think the war in Ukraine has definitely disturbed the peace process at large. The fourth is the ongoing uh, tensions in the cross-strait ties. And I think, um, you know, uh, the, the recent visit of the US Congress uh, um, women, uh, Miss uh, Nancy Pelosi's visit to Taiwan has definitely created a rupture in the cross-strait ties. And I think that has definitely derailed the peace process. And on top of this, I think the pandemic has also affected the peace process. And among all of these destabilizing factors, and I think what is not really being helpful is that when we are seeing a barbaric and more aggressive posture from North Korea. And in fact, there are three case studies to take an example, how North Koreans have reacted to the similar incident in the uh, recent incidents, and which has actually significantly damaged the peace process. One is the way North Korea has actually reacted Nancy Pelosi's visit to Taiwan. If we see, I think North, North Korea is not really directly linked with the incident, but since the world is becoming more divided between uh, you know, US and China, between US-led and Chinese-led uh, security architecture, North Korea has drawn confidence to react to the incident. Second, I think the way North Korea has reacted to NATO's expansion, and I think that's a critical issue we should not really overlook. Um, that explains the way North Korea has explained and criticized about NATO and the way it has commented that there is probably an emergence of an Asian NATO. It, it speaks about the kind of self-confidence North Korea is getting out of all of these conflicts and um, uh, current situation. The third is last year's reactions to uh, the AUKUS uh, development. The way North Korea actually reacted to the AUKUS, the trilateral technology sharing agreement between Australia, UK, and United States. That also sp speaks about the futuristic behavior and the approach that North Korea holds towards the region. So these are grave, uh, uh, grave challenges we need to really talk about. We cannot really talk about the peace process without really analyzing the behavior and the approaches from where North Korea is gaining its confidence. But while saying that, I think we also have to see the larger picture in the, in the global politics in order to talk about free and united Korea. And I think there are three big tensions are currently taking place. One is, of course, many speakers in the morning and in this session has already talked about, that is the divide between the democratic and the authoritarian set of countries. 
And I think there we need to really figure it out how to go about peace, how to go about talking about a free and uni unified Korea. The world is, will only be further divided from now on. We will probably not see uh, in near future US-China relationship you know, getting back to normal. I, I also don't really be very optimistic to see that China and their relations in Asia is going to be normal anytime soon. So the world will be much more divided from now on. So we have to find a way out how to convince North Korea not to really be with the authoritarian um, built ups uh, that the world uh, politics is currently w w witnessing. The second, I think um, there is a significant, the, the, the significance of norms and values, um, uh, including peace, uh, is getting lost in um, global uh, politics today. I think there was a time whenever there was a uh, conflict, at least there was a reference to the UN mandate. There was a reference to the high principles of peaceful coexistence. There was a reference to the value system, um, uh, which is not the case right now. Uh, we have seen, um, you know, during the Ukraine Russia war, we have seen uh, during the cross strait tensions currently, there is no reference of the UN, there is no reference of mediation, there is no reference of values and uh, norms. And that's a huge setback. If we have to talk about a free and united Korea, we have to make a case that the significance of norms and values in international politics should be restored. And I think the third is also equally significant. The significance of the multilateral institutions and multilateral forums should not be ever undermined. Of course, as I mentioned, United Nations uh, is a classic example, but there are many multilateral institutions are still there, which are still not very effective. We have Shanghai Cooperation Organization. We have uh, you know, many forums, many multilateral institutions in the Indo-Pacific regions, but none of these multilateral institutions are being really effectively being run or effective enough to reduce the tensions. And on the contrary to that, what we are seeing that there is a rise of minilateralism in world politics. There are trilateral, there are quadrilateral, there are minilateral forums are emerging. While from nation state's point of view, uh, these are realistic forums and these might be beneficial to some of the set, some set of the countries, but on a larger, from the viewpoint of a larger global peace and stability, these are definitely not encouraging issues. And therefore, when we are talking about peace and stability, denuclearization of North Korea, or let's say denuclearization of the Korean Peninsula, we need to really talk about the significance and the importance of the multilateral institutions. Therefore, I would conclude by saying, I think there are three, three broader issues we need to really talk about. One, and I think when we are talking about DPRK, uh, we need to stay engaged with the DPRK, no matter how difficult it is. Staying engaged with North Korea really is, uh, you know, uh, helps us to overcome um, a lot of challenges and difficulties. Second, I think there is a greater need to build a consensus on how to approach North Korea. I think that approach has not really been defined yet. It has only been superpower centric. It has only been six party centric or eight party centric. It has not really gone beyond that. I think there are countries like India, there are countries, many countries in the Europe, including where I'm uh, based in currently in Sweden, they have a role to play. So therefore we need to develop a consensus on North Korea. Third, I think we need to also, uh, uh, you know, uh, evolve and promote a comprehensive understanding and approach about a participatory road framework. And I think the pre previous president in South Korea talked ab about uh, participatory framework. In fact, uh, you know, uh, President Park also talked about uh, a participatory Northeast Asian uh, participatory security framework. But today, I think we need to really talk about in concrete participatory framework, how to really approach the unified Korea issues, including the free and unified Korea. And I think there, uh, we need to draw lessons from history, who are the countries could play a stronger role. And I think India has it um, you know, tremendous track record historically. India has played a significant role during the Korean Peninsula, Korean War history period. And I think we need to draw lessons from there. But again, I think what is uh, really uh, important here, and that would be my concluding uh, point to make, that if we see, it's not always that 
we have to talk about peaceful uh, solution to everything. Uh, and I think if we go back to the history, uh, there are five principles of peaceful coexistence. And if we see in the context of China and India, the five principles of peaceful coexistence has not really worked. So it is one thing to talk about the peaceful coexistence. And we should not forget the fact that when we are talking about peace, peaceful practices, peaceful coexistence, these are management exercises. These are management practices. These are not permanent solutions. So what we need to talk about is a peaceful permanent solution to the, to the issue. And therefore, uh, I think it, it makes sense to support a free and united Korea. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Panda, for your very comprehensive talk. And then um, I point out those destabilizing factors and then the importance of norms and values, and then also uh, importance of multinational internet institutions. Yeah, really, thank you. And um, our next uh, speaker is uh, Dr. Uh, Margaret Rita Bales Terros. Director of International Cooperation uh, at the Depart Education Department of the Philippines. Uh, she also sent a video message and, and she is a senior manager of the department relationship with ASEAN, the Southeast Asia uh, Ministers of uh, Education Organization, Asia Pacific Economic Cooperation on Human Resource Development. Yeah, let's welcome uh, he, her message. Good afternoon, dear friends, colleagues in the education sector, and also I would like to extend my heartfelt thanks to the organizers through the Global Peace Foundation for this invitation for the Philippines International Cooperation Office of the Department of Education. Share its thoughts and reflections on how we can move forward Korea's unification. As early as 1948, there started the beginning of bilateral relations between the Philippines and that of Korea. Expeditions took over during the PEF top deployment during the Korean War in the 1950s for Filipinos to assist South Korea in defending itself against the North Korean assault solidified the friendship. And when we talk of friendship between two countries, usually it is sealed when we have bilateral relations. And when we do so, we also move forward a number of things, like we look at the needs of our leaders as well as our Filipino and Korean citizenry. From our end, as peace advocates through the programs and projects of the department, hand in hand with the Ministry of Education of Korea, we have been moving around the country as well as bringing the flag of our partnership in terms of spreading what global citizenship education is all about. And aside from that, for this year, we are celebrating the 10th year anniversary of our Korea-Philippine teacher exchange programs, wherein this program aims to put and to bring together Korean teachers as well as our Filipino teachers in one big community of global citizenship education advocates over the years for these 10 years one of the many objectives of the program is also for peace development and also for sharing of expertise not only in terms of the education but also on how we can solve problems together that beset communities where we all live as well as families at the same time. But zeroing in in education, what is it? What is the role of education when we talk of unification? Korea, South Korea for that matter, has been doing a lot 
of extensive outreach, not only that of the Philippines, but also in other countries, wherein specifically in the Asia Pacific, where we do have teachers all over the Pacific region. And again, I would overemphasize that it is through education that we all move forward for Korea's unification. Let us invest then on educating our young people and make them understand and teach them what history has taught us. And from there, strategically, we move forward for our agenda for unification, for friendship, and for establishing and making South Korea with North Korea great again. There are a number of ways by which we can come together. And here in the Philippines, when we talk of peace development, we consider dialogues, communication, talks, peace talks. We go through peace process. All of this would disarm us of our individual differences and we come at table through education and we get to learn from each other and how we agree for the common purpose and that is to be together, to live in harmony, to get to be united so that the next generation to come will also do the same for, me and for that and with that it will make a country not only yours but ours benefit from each other. Thank you very much again for this invitation and I wish everyone a happy afternoon and a peaceful conference until its end. Kamsamida. Thank you. Thank Dr. Palesteros for her uh, very warm talk uh, about the long history uh, of uh, Philippines and our case since the 1948 and then also the later active participation of the UN force uh, to support Korea and then uh, especially the current friendship and the education exchange and collaboration global citizenship peace and even unification education. Um, next I would like to introduce uh, uh, Dato Lat uh, Shamiram Abdullah, uh, who is a former political secretary of the Prime Minister of Malaysia and a former special function officer of the Malaysia Parliament, Parliament and the Minister, Ministry of uh, Defense, Ministry of Finance, and the Prime Minister's Office. So let's welcome uh, Dato Lat. <laughs> Thank you, Mr. Moderator. Good afternoon. Two more left, so I hope you keep awake. <laughs> it's so wonderful to be back in Seoul after two years of pandemic. One of the lessons I learned, at least for me, is to be grateful of the freedom we all now enjoy. Once again, we are all here to affirm together that the dream of a united Korea should never fade until it meets its glorious victory. Not just for Koreans, but also for the world at large. I'm here with my lovely wife, Noor, and young son, Lat Omar, who is himself a member of the youth, Malaysian Youth Parliament. I'm reminded by Omar that we need to engage the youth also of what we do today and discuss today and for them to keep alive this struggle as we pass the torch to his generation and the generations to come. I am Malaysian. My country is one of the most cosmo cosmopolitan of nations in Asia, a melting pot of peoples, especially of East Asia. I mean, a uh, melting pot of people of the East, Southeast Asians, East, Northeast, and Far East Asians, the South Asians, and the Middle East Asians, 13 states and three federal territories make up the Federation of Malaysia. 
one part of the mainland, a peninsula like Korea, which we also call West Malaysia, and the other is an on island, far away across the South China Sea, which we call East Malaysia. The fastest time by flight in West Malaysia, from West Malaysia to a city in East Malaysia is two hours. Unlike many nations with a compass direction prefix, East and West Malaysia has never been at war, which was with each other. Our slogan of unity, which was started by Prime Minister Najib Raza in 2008, is Satu Malaysia or One Malaysia, or Hana Malaysia. We truly understand and value our unity, which we wish for our brothers and sisters here. We appreciate this and wish for you too to have a one, a true and lasting one Korea. Korea has been a long and close friend of Malaysia since the days when Malacca ruled the East and West Strait in the 16th and 17th century before the colonial powers came. Prime Minister Dr. Mahathir Mohamad when came to power in 1981, propounded a national policy, which we still implement until today. It is called the Look East policy. This policy meant that we look to Eastern developed nations first for inspiration, ethics, morality, technology, and development before we look to the West. Immediately, we send youth to study in South Korea, Japan, and China to top university. My, my son is a, went to China, to the Shanghai Jiao Tong University there. Malaysia thought that after 300 years of Western colonialism, colonialism it was enough. And we found, we found out that the Eastern nations who were more willing to guide, assist, and transfer their technologies than the ones in the faraway West. It is a long practice of peoples of the East, from the teachings of Islam, Buddhism and Confucianism to prosper their neighbor. Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, said, heaven is not for those who seize their neighbors hungry and do nothing. Confucius says, in, pursuit, in the pursuit of happiness, just do two things, to be loyal to yourself and be good to your neighbors. Ladies and gentlemen, in the context of a united career, I will attempt to be as frank and candid as I can. And I apologize for that for, at my start. A country doesn't fight with itself. What was West Germany no longer fights with what was once East Germany. Similarly, what was North Vietnam has the previous South Vietnam as part of itself. They are now united as one nation. Can they fight within themselves? Sure they can. That's the beauty of unification. Any married couple can attest to that. Dissent, without having to deny that no dissenting opinion or ideology shall prevail over the commonality of culture, history, and kinship. The dividing borders are man-made. So are all borders. But recent divisions arising of differences of opinion among one people are a sad tragedy. It gives the world its saddest sound as if divorce is not bad enough, there has to be ongoing mutual suspicions. Threats of war and bloodshed become the medium of the continuation of the split. Peace becomes a fragile commodity and everything that are normal become almost extinct. People suffer. My point is anything that's the result of human behavior is humanly possible to be altered, not by force, but by constant reminders of commonalities that supersedes the separation of people. It is unfortunate that in the previous two examples, unification was achieved through the the destruction. <laughs> the destruction of the other. I'm sorry. It became the crowning glory of victory of one over the other. Perhaps it was such that brought about this attrition between North and South Korea. One fears to be subjugated by the other. 
but it is the continuing continuing abrasion the whole the holy work of the people domiciled in the peninsula or is it the coral mostly a proxy fight in the guise of the people's wishes and well-being the answer the answer is obvious no one nation can survive a war of attrition this long without outside subtle prodding it is to these outsiders that we appeal for non-interference and peace no ideology is worth promoting if the ensuing result entails suffering of a people whose recent roots are the same peace and prosperity is their right not the imposition of external ideologies we have a saying at home bila perahu berlalu kiambang pun bertaut meaning when the vessel passes the reeds will come together in the asean or southeast asian nations experience the split of vietnam gave prosperity to thailand singapore and malaysia a united vietnam now competes with us for foreign investments tension in the korean peninsula benefits who surely not south korea taiwan or japan all neighbors suffer the division of this country was not the wish of her people their opinion was not asked it was imposed so it is natural and logical that now the people's opinion are counted people like you today who are joined here to plea for a united korean peninsula things are not in despair for as long as there is kinship there is hope but selfish plans only delay the day of reckoning the human spirit shall always prevail south korea is like a taiwan on the mainland it is a relic of the world post world war ii but there are forces who want things to remain so it is the golden age of of some but that is inevitably fading unification is big about being one warts and all it's not about being the dog in the manga for all of korea it is about living and let live let's not burden the people of korea with superpower deals a united korea should be proxy to none and friends to all in these troubled times the far east does not need another boiling pot whose interest does it save whose interest does it serve to be so so let's start with the freer and trade dealing in necessities North Korea has been sending its robust workforce abroad, like the copper mines on the island of Borneo. South Korea, in turn, has technological know-how. It would be easier for both countries in terms of specialized labor if Korea is united and the employment of the skilled laborers is proliferated further. North Korea may be economically less developed than South Korea, but that should not be a problem. For unification, looking at East Germany's easy assimilation to the West Germany's industrial activities, each can benefit from the other. Is if kinship is allowed to rule, a few miles from an artificial border does not distance people for from a common kinship that was built over centuries and generations. Separation breeds mutual threats that keep peace away. It is a state of an of affairs never before imposed in the history of the korea it is a foreign ploy that burdens the korean people all we wish and pray for is for the people of korea to be left to decide on its its best path to walk on god's earth as a united nation a one korea thank you very much thank you dr uh, lot and uh Thanks. So talking about the e, uh, look east policy, talking about uh, point out the weakness of uh, Germany and uh, Vietnam unification model uh, through annihilation of the other, and this also gives a chance opportunity for Korea to create a new model of uh, uh, unification through a, a joint effort. To, uh, yeah. Thank you, Dr. Lat, and uh, our last speaker. Uh, is uh, Dr. Fenika uh, Christianto, uh, Vice Rector of the Present University, Indonesia. He, she is also a founder of uh, uh, Fenika and the Associate Law for Office. And uh, previously, uh, she served as the Chief Legal Officer of the Frank Cope Interna uh, Indonesia and the former head of the School of Law at Present University. And she, uh, let's welcome uh, Dr. Fenika Christianto.
So good afternoon, uh, all of you. I hope you're still awake. Yeah. <laughs> After lunch. Um, yeah. Uh, welcome uh, to this event and thank you for this opportunity uh, to the, the committee. So, uh, yes, actually, when refer to this uh, theme, yeah, why is a free and unified Korea good for Indonesia, particularly? and in general uh, for the Asian region. Okay, before that, I think uh, back to the um, uh, year before, yeah, in, actually, we have a good relationship, yeah, which is Indonesia and South Korea. And also we do have the relationship with the North Korea. So in this case, like the, of course, we as the, um, the third party would like to have a good relation with both of them. But if uh, both of them are in conflict, so it will give the impact, of course, not the good one, yeah, unless they would like to be uh, unified. So when the unifications of North Korea and South Korea uh, happen, I think, it will be great for Indonesia, particularly, and also for the Asian regions. Why? Because as we know that we are really in a neighborhood, and uh, as we know also that um, the conflict between North Korea and South Korea, not just because of the uh, Korean Peninsula, but also uh, currently, also the issue about the uh, nuclear weapon, I think like uh, the former speakers before, they talk about the uh, uh, the impact of the nuclear weapons and also uh, there is the objective from uh, some countries that if this uh, still continue uh, from the North Korea and maybe uh, his ally. Okay, so in my opinion, actually, um, yeah, we are going to celebrate like around 49 years, yeah, a partnership or a collaboration with South Korea I mean, Indonesia and South Korea. And in this case, of course, uh, uh, like President Jokowi last time met with the president of South Korea, they are agreed on uh, several things, yeah, actually that uh, they agreed on uh, try to improving the, um, the peace and the security for the world, as well as uh, developing uh, the nations of each country and also all nations in the world. So in this case, uh, actually Indonesia is really um, supporting that um, achieving the unifications of North Korea and South Korea. And also um, based on my experience, even when I teach in my university, actually I also have several students from North Korea. And all, not just uh, South Korea, but also North Korea. And I know because of uh, the situations Indonesia also has a difficulty uh, to accept them as the students or even as the workers in this case. So that's why if the unification will be achieved, of course, it will be great for uh, all parties. And um, also one thing that I remember, um, actually South Korea uh, is pretty close with the North Korea and also with the neighbor in Asian region. And uh, from the former speakers, they talk about the economical uh, impact, of course, yeah. And some of them say that maybe uh, there, there are some disparities, okay, between North Korea and South Korea. And I think we have to be agreed first. I think disparity or, um, or even uh, uh, the differentiations between them, I think it will be great. Yeah, uh, as far as we can uh, sit together and, and discuss and uh, give the dialogue and try to put in into the action, of course, yeah. So, and uh, based on the conventional uh, concept, I think, for the one who have the more uh, prosperity yeah, or the more knowledge or the more um, uh, skills, I think we have to help the one that who doesn't have uh, that kind of uh, skills or uh, ability or that power. So in this case, maybe uh, as a siblings, North Korea and South Korea, I believe that they will hand in hand try to uh, help one to another. Yeah, in this case, uh, maybe um, learning from the Indonesian's um, government, 
and the leadership from our country. Actually, I can share that uh, I think early in the morning that if, uh, Prof. Mustafa Mulia uh, already talked about the five principles of Pancasila that become a way of life of Indonesia. And I just want to um, uh, stress out uh, three of them, which is the first one is, of course, belief in uh, one God or Almighty God. I think this is also in line with our tagline yeah, uh, from the GPF that actually one family under God. So all of us actually, we are siblings. We are sisters and brothers. So that's why we have to uh, taking care one to another. And also it will uh, seriously contribute uh, whatever that we can contribute to these unifications of South Korea and North Korea. And then, uh, the third principle, which is the unity of Indonesia, I think it's not just for Indonesia. Unity of Indonesia also a concern about the unity of mankind in the world. So that's why not just for uh, Indonesia or Asian region, but also for all nations in the world. And the last one, of course, uh, we have to see that um, social justice. Yeah, social justice, I think it's also related to the um, second principle of Indonesia, which is uh, humanity. As the chairman, Dr. Priston Moon, this morning said that actually, uh, yes, uh, God gives the fundamental human rights. So that's why we can start from that. And also, uh, I still remember that one of the speaker uh, said that uh, why we cannot sit together and working closely yeah, in order to achieve this unification. Yes, of course, about the trust and confidence. Maybe uh, we have to build the, the good robot first, trust, yeah, in order to have that. Uh, it's not easy, yeah, basically. So I came from the um, legal background. Yeah, I'm a lawyer as well. So when I try to mediate all clients, yeah, so I have to know, so what is the interest of each of them? And then we try to negotiate. We try to put them uh, uh, in order to get the uh, best alternative uh, negotiation agreement. So it has to be a consensus first. Of course, before that, they will see what is the cost, what is the benefit between North Korea and South Korea. I mean, for each of them. Of course, we would like to have the mutual agreement and the mutual benefit, not just for that uh, North Korea and South Korea, but also it will give the domino impact uh, to all of the nation in the world. I think um, so the last message that I would like to uh, share actually that yes, we have to remember that we are coming from one and we are also uh, become the humankind that is created by the creator. And uh, because that, that actually we are in a family and uh, we, have to be res we have to respect our ancestor, yeah, no matter what, because uh, we, we do have the blood tradition. And I think, and I believe, uh, in my opinion, all of us actually, we are brother and sisters. That's all, thank you. Okay, thank, thank you, Dr. Feneca, yeah, for your uh, sharing of uh, your thoughts, especially you even uh, talk about your personal experience of teaching North Korean students, um, both North and South Korean, and even engagement with North Korean workers. This is actually early in the morning, someone else was talking about, it. we need to reach out to the workers. That maybe David Maxwell says so. Yeah, and uh, so you are actually doing it. That's a really great. And then also so Indonesia as the largest Muslim country in the world now is, uh, has increasing international aspiration and uh, by the fact of uh, President Djokovic's visit uh, to the North uh, East Asia region recently and also even before to Ukraine, Russia. So this is really a great uh, opportunity for Indonesia to play a positive uh, role in the world and then including the five uh, national principles application even could uh, apply to the unified Korea. So yeah, thank you, uh, uh, Dr. Fenneka. So, ladies and gentlemen, this uh, concludes this session of uh, the peace and security. And congratulations to all the speakers, conveners, and partners, and as uh, participants. Uh, together, we made this uh, forum possible. 
Uh, I'm looking forward for future ongoing collaboration with all of you to uh, advance a free unified Korea agenda. And uh, actually, it's, uh, we have uh, two more virtual sessions. One we uh, did tonight, 8 p.m., and another one is tomorrow night, 8 p.m. So I hope uh, you all can join uh, on by Zoom or by uh, YouTube, the Action for Korea United uh, uh, YouTube channel. You can also watch. Um, yeah, thank you. Uh, Thank you.